If you're looking for a clean, sober, professional, academic, well-researched, historically accurate, generally accurate, serious podcast on Southern folklore, ghosts, bizarre events, and unique people, this podcast is not for you. However, if you've decided you can live with that, then join us for The Strange South. We can make you've been you got singing on the brain. Song. I am because I'm going to sing you my song today. Is that is that part of your story? You go first today, I think, right? I do. It you has finished your to, killer I ghost do. thing. Thank fucking God. So does everybody get the benefit of your song, or is that an after? Is that a patrons only song? I think everybody. Yay! The Yay. gift of giving. Right. Well, let's go uh, ahead and talk. The gift of Advil mm. <laughs> and muscle relaxer. The gift of pharmaceuticals. That's right. Modern Yum, day medication. Yay, wash it down with denial. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Marley. Really is the right name for the drink. Hi, Patrice. Hi, Courtney. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> so we are talking about this drink mm-hmm. that Courtney just named Denial, mm-hmm. which is so much better than Thanksgiving cleanser. <laughs> Sounded like a colon. I didn't want you to think right. you're gonna make you go go. Yeah, because we're recording now the Sunday after Thanksgiving, mm. prior to the beginning of the work Back week. To work. Yes. Mm-hmm. So and yeah, denial is <laughs> key critical to, to, to survival. To making it this Crit- next week, <laughs> exactly. two weeks, three weeks. Oh my gosh. When everybody is involved in some way or another in academia, mm-hmm. yes. it's like, come on, come on, winter break. Come it's, on, come on, come on. We can yes. do this if we have denial. If we, ha- we need more denial in our lives. <laughs> yes, join us. Join us, friends. <laughs> join us in denial. It's a, yes. it's a rye whiskey cocktail with oh, so good. lemon juice, lime juice. All the dashes of grenadine and merry cherry juice mm. from my brandy cherries that have been around a year or almost a year since like December yes. 8th if, or something. If they're bad for us, don't tell us because we've been drinking and eating them all week. We've got like, they're like zombie cherries, y'all. They're like little desiccated cherries on the side, but they still taste really good. And they've just been living in alcohol for a year. So hopefully that's that's the key right it's there. The it's, it is kind of cleansing, you mm-hmm. know. I think it's good still. So How it's a little it tart. Be? This is like denial. Like denial. <laughs> denial is a little bitter. It's a little bitter. Like it, <laughs> it, it hurts a little, but it's got that sweet behind it that makes you willing to face the other day coming. But if you deny enough, it, it, just everything else goes down smoothly. <laughs> everything stops mattering. <laughs> everything stops mattering. That's where I'm going. You deny enough. <laughs> <laughs> Next week's drink, apathy. <laughs> uh, I'll need that before next Sunday. <laughs> I missed you guys. Oh, man. <laughs> man. Uh, I do not like being on break without y'all. Man. Yeah. Yeah. I did a lot of vegging out in front of the TV. That's good. Just that's, not thinking. Oh, that's perfect. I don't even know what I did. I feel like I was very busy. I think I was very busy, but I don't but really nothing, know why. I, w- I was very busy, but nothing happened. I, yeah. How do you do kinda, that? I don't know. It's no. kind of how that feels. I had a whole list of shit that was mm-hmm. going to get done last week. And I did get, you know, but my, a lot of them were like Thanksgiving meal related. <sighs> mm-hmm. And uh, so thinking, uh, prepping, and then they all go away, and it's like, why the fuck did I spend so much time on that shit? Like, right. That was my whole week. <laughs> well, thank God I didn't have to do all of that, and I was mm. so relieved. And I kept thinking, okay, I need to clean up my closet because mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. that needs to get done. I need to like do all these things, clear my cabinet space, clear like all this stuff. And so I'd walk by it and think it, and then it just as soon as I cross that doorway, it'd go out of my head. Yeah, <laughs> same here. Didn't so, clean mine out. Weren't you the one that taught us that crossing through doorways is braces memories? Yes, yes. So, um, so yeah, it it's works. True, it works. It works wonders. <laughs> you got to tie a reminder around your finger or wrist or 
pair of jeans that are too little that you need to wrap around your waist to remember to go back in. Well, that's all of my jeans. Yes. It's like I'm thinking all the time, what have I forgot? What have I forgot? What have I forgot? uh, Right. Well, you know, 1999. (laughs) You have like, you know, maybe the six inch gap of clothes that I wear. Mm -hmm. And that's all that I wear. It's like this closet full of shit. (laughs) And then I've got like six feet Mm -hmm. of like clothes. And I'm like, you know, this other stuff is not going to happen. I just need to make peace with that and just get it out of my life. Just, just clean it. Just, just oh. it out. But right now, I'm in denial. Oh. Denial. Yes. So, denial. It's not happening. So, yes. when, when, as I was sitting around the couch being most productive, oh, that was sarcasm. <laughs> yeah. Got, um, got it. Okay. Uh, I started, start, well, let me tell you, this is one thing that happened. I don't know what got, like, the week of giving was basically the theme for Rose in my house oh, this week. Oh, yeah. Because mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I get to sleep past 530. So oh, I'm like, bless. yes. And so about 7 o'clock, I hear the dog, and the dog is just, like, running up and down the house and bumping into the bed. And she, and she usually bumps in the bed, like, when she wants me to get out of the bed. And I'm like, fuck. What is happening? Because she only does that if there's something loose in the house. Mm -hmm. And about that time, I hear my son go, Mom, chipmunk. (laughs) He was asleep too. (laughs) Right? So I had um, 7 o'clock, 6.30, and like another 7 o'clock chipmunk release in my house this week. So three in a row. Um, gifts and all before reasonable hours all before reasonable hours so because i get up several times in the night we have like a doggy door um but that we like to keep open so the dog can get up in the middle of the night and go to the bathroom and she won't wake us up but after a certain point um in my the many times that i get up in the middle of the night uh i'd like would go in there and close it i'm like what's ever in the house mm-hmm. stays and whatever's outside stays <laughs> and that way and after i did that after like the fourth night um everything was cool mm-hmm. so i actually got to not have to chase a chipmunk and the last chipmunk i chased was like balls to the wall <laughs> like itty bitty chipmunk balls to the wall bald. yeah no <laughs> no he was terrifying. so no. rambunctious like he would he was climbing up the walls bouncing off the beds and usually i just oh my god chase them like on the ground to like get them out the door but he was all over the place. It was like the road run, not the road runner. Oh, what was it? Speedy Gonzalez. Speedy Gonzalez. Yes. <laughs> so I said, You will not kill me. <laughs> That's right. Underlay. <laughs> so um, finally I sat down. I was sitting there with my coffee and the song came into my head. <gasps> and so I started writing these phrases oh. down. And oh then my God, I'm I, so excited. I, am too. I went on to YouTube so that I can learn to play the part that goes along with the lyrics. <gasps> this is so cool. And You're now awesome. I'm going to sing them to you. And of course, y'all know I'm going to fuck it up. <laughs> I've only been practicing it for like two days and my fingers are screaming from the, um, the ukulele thing. The strings. And plus, I can't fucking sing. And this song is so high. I don't have like a high singing voice. <laughs> but you wrote it. But, you wrote it. <laughs> but no, but y'all, y'all don't understand. Y'all don't understand. You'll, you will understand. <laughs> okay. As okay. soon as I. I'm so I do this. excited about this. I'm so nervous. I don't y'all. know how to change keys, but I would say, like, can't you just I lower could, it to sure. the front? If I was like I could musically do it. inclined. Oh, I could do it. I could do it. Okay. Ooh. Well, maybe it's something that we'll do later on. We but can produce it. Yes. We can and get free somebody. a video. We <gasps> go, oom bapa, oom bapa. Yes. Oom bapa, bow, bow, bow. Bow. <laughs> Get it up. First concert ever. <laughs> Oak Ridge Boys. <laughs> Okay, so bear with. Okay. I'm sorry for my singing. Like I said, I'm not a singer. Ah! This is so cool. <laughs> Prepare for the world premiere. For the world's worst <laughs> premiere <laughs> ever. Premier we may cut this. But this is song. This, this is for y'all. If we cut it, patrons, you get it. That's right. If we cut it, patrons, you get it. Love. 
Thank you. Add that to your playlist. Yes. <laughs> That's Woo! so good. <laughs> Check that uke playing out. Woo! So I literally <laughs> sat there and listed everything that she has brought in. And it's like, I've got to make this work. That's the best. That's so cool. I never would have thought that would be your Christmas song. <laughs> that was so good. That was so good. Rose. Cheers. 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 Two rows. Two rows. And oh. the rabbit under the bed. Oh. Mm. The departed rinse. <laughs> so good. Mm-hmm. That, well, that's the best way to start the episode ever. Yeah. <laughs> Let me finish this. I know. I was thinking the tartness would slow us down, but y'all over there empty. Mm. Mm-mm. Mm. All right. So, anything else that we need? Oh, to there are bring a couple of things I figured we should say to note. because, excuse me, holidays, all that shit. Yes, we released. <gasps> yes, we did the first ever Strange South gift guide. Uh huh. With links to twenty eight or some twenty seven, twenty seven, twenty eight gifts, something, something some, tw- in the in the <laughs> the ballpark of <laughs> nearly thirty gifts. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, that we thought you might enjoy, nearly right? Nearly, 30. and we all three were like searching the Amazons for fun things that we thought that our listeners and our fans and the people that we and know and that love we might would enjoy. also buy as well. Exactly. So you know it's going to be good yes. because we have impeccable taste. <laughs> And, and it's so, a wide range. It is. It's a of, wide range. It is a wide range of stuff. A wide range of stuff and a wide range of prices. So mm-hmm. to that's fit right. Every budget. To fit every budget. And so you can find that on our website, strangesouth.com, or the Facebook, or the Twitter, or the Instagram, or the fan group. Right. We, we spread it out everywhere. And get out there on the fan group if you're not on there, because they're fun. Yes. They're um, fun. And also, well, I mean, actually, I could also say this. If, if you aren't already on the fan group or anything, you might have missed an opportunity, because our, uh, our merch site on Redbubble had a sale for yes. cyber whatever. Monday. Have, there's something for everyone. Everything. Yeah. It's like Cyber Monday and Giving Tuesday and Wet T shirt Wednesday. <laughs> like everything has a day. From here to from here to Christmas. All right. So take advantage of that. Take advantage of wet t shirt Wednesday and go on. <laughs> There's uh, go outside we in have... twenty eight degree weather. <laughs> nip <sized. laughs> I see it. There's uh so yeah, we have uh, a lot of merch on Red Bubble, the stuff like um coffee. My my strange self coffee mug is like literally my favorite. Coffee I know I use mug. mine all the time. It's got the, the skull and crow design. There are three different designs. If you're not used to red bubbles, sometimes it can be a little weird to navigate. So just know if you only see like a couple things on there, right. click around a little bit because there's quite a lot of merch on there with yes. strange south designs on it. You just have to kind of yeah. sometimes oh, you have what, to figure it out. Yeah, and usually what they do is like you click on the design and then the design reveals all the merchandise that has yeah. that design on it. So. so there's like masks and mugs and travel. Apple mugs and journals and like curtains and pillows. Mm. If you see all of our drink pictures and see the giant strange South pillow in that's the back there. and think that you might like that, that's on there. Mm-hmm. So um, all that. And then there are still some, uh, there's a, uh, there's a small bunch of t-shirts on our website. Maybe by the time this is out, we'll have our tie dye ones up there that y'all saw. We created like three months ago. In the ago. summer. <laughs> our summer tie dyes will be ready. Our summer ready tie dyes will be ready for <laughs> next summer. For next summer. But, uh, um, yeah, go ahead and hit us up because there's some fun on under stuff it in and there. Just call it your Christmas yeah. shirt. Yeah. Yes. So I just figured I would bring. Oh, oh, and I did want to say that after last episode, I um, I felt compelled to make a lot of Jello for Thanksgiving this year, and so uh, I made. Uh, I think I've said before that I do je- I do Thanksgiving breakfast every year because I can't watch the parade at my house and I'm weird about the parade and I have to see it every year. So I go to my parents' house and bring them booze and like it's snacks. It's the best order ever. It's the best way to start Thanksgiving. I do it all for me. But <laughs> it's um, <laughs> so I made I made a fruit jello mold with like a cool whip jello layer in in on Thanksgiving morning and then I made I made sunset salad from the recipe that I posted on the show page last week from my episode. And it is orange jello with grated carrots, pineapples, lemon juice, 
and I don't know, other shit. How did it turn out? I loved it. Oh, good. I mean, like, it was exactly what my, and my dad was like, did I make this or did my mom make this? I'm like, you made this. You made it a lot when mm-hmm. I was in high school. And um, so I made that and I I was just like transported. I love that shit. So. That's awesome. Anyway, I, I made lots of jello. I had jello as well. And it had Ooh. nothing to do with uh, anybody listening to our podcast. <laughs> 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 it's my dad's favorite that my grandmother used to make and my mother made it and it is an orange almost like an orange sherbet jello Ooh. with so it's like, it tastes like a creamsicle <gasps> like an orange creamsicle i saw recipes like that it's like orange jello with cool whip mixed in and or it's cream it, cheese or yeah it, and it's and it has um uh mandarin oranges in it mm. That's the fruit. And so that was really good. Nom. And that brought back memories as well. Yes. Jello was the, the least vegetarian part of my Thanksgiving. <laughs> yes. Yes. I did enjoy it. So, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Hit up merch. Do all those things. Do all those we things. We love you. Join our family. And if, yeah. And if you have any questions or are looking for something like, hit us up. Just oh, yeah. Shoot us a DM or email or whatever. Email. Oh, there was another thing I wanted to mention. So I started thinking that we are always like trolling, not trolling, but we're always kind of creeping around Reddit <laughs> looking for trolls stories. Trolls. Trolls. Yes. And, and we would love to hear your stories rather than creeping around Reddit looking for other people's. And if you Absolutely. don't think that you have enough of a story to write a whole big thing or do a listener lore or any of that, Send, if you've got like even a sentence, right. send it to stories at thestrangesouth.com because I've started thinking, you know, I'm a writer, like, like officially, like mm. that's, how she is. that's what I'm trained to do. And I haven't been doing fiction for like years and I would like to, but I also have all this other shit to do. So if fiction writing kind of uh, joined hands with the other shit I had to do, then that would make my life super happy. And if you want to send something that happened to you that you don't think is fleshed out enough to be a good story and say hey why don't you make this a story i would love to take that on yeah. so send oh, it to awesome. stories at the strange south.com and um let me know yes yes absolutely and we have uh, i have gotten several things from um kenneth who's a Yay. great uh person to send us info and everything and kenneth i have all of your emails and i promise you i'm gonna get to them um and thank you so much because you definitely have filled in some gaps yeah um, as far as so story ideas good sources yeah. yeah so thank you you're first today i am and i am ready to be done with these ghost stories killer ghost killer ghost killer ghost stories In 1886, there lived a woman in the city of Philadelphia. Hmm. All of her friends and family adored her. She excelled through school and had many friends and sweethearts to show for it. (laughs) That's what excelling means for a woman. In the 1886s. Throughout school, she had been told that she could make it as a big-time actress just off of her looks alone. So upon graduation, she moved out of her parents' house to try and start an acting career in New York City. New New York City? (laughs) Oh, my. (laughs) She was more than confident that she would become the next fresh face to capture the world, for throughout her life, everyone always told her how gorgeous she was, and what's more dangerous is that she knew it. Mm. So people spoke... (laughs) Mm-hmm. <laughs> women Judging. who know they're pretty exactly I'm like, wow that's insane <laughs> so people spoke of the woman um, as though her looks rivaled that of cleopatra herself no matter what she tried in life she would usually get by just on her looks alone this woman led an easy life and took it all for granted people would go out of their way to help this beautiful woman especially the men folk she soon made it on Broadway, and eventually she she was all any of the cast directors could talk about. Every show wanted to see her sing and dance and showcase her exceptional beauty. Her parents gave her more than enough money to live independently while working in the Big Apple, even though she was making a decent income. 
She had long since lost touch with her doting parents, short of her still collecting support money from them, uh, along with all the friends she had had back home. So she basically ditched everybody that like she grew up with, and she's mm. like, yes, you can still give me money and admire me, but I am big time now. But I won't return your phone calls. Yeah, right. Eventually, the woman started seeing New York City and the business she had found herself in as the vicious, shallow snare for which it was. After several years of leading an actress's exciting, fast-paced lifestyle, <laughs> the easy life that had spoiled the woman for so long ah! soon became Sorry. less attentive. Yes. I'm just saying, like, actors actually work really hard, and it's hard to be an actor. <laughs> well, I know, but they gave her money, so she didn't That's have to true. even work. That's right. true. That's what the That's point true. was. Yes, yes, I get it. Okay, that is sorry, the point. sorry, sorry. They no. gave her all the money without her having to earn anything. Right. She, so and, she and had just extra. Told her how beautiful she was, and so and she I mean, knew it. I was like that. Yeah. I'm not gonna hate on her for any of that. Mm, I hate on everybody. Ah, <laughs> you're such a hater. <laughs> <laughs> so. Though she was still one of the most beautiful young women ever to grace the stage, she was no longer the only one. Mm -hmm. What was once handed to her on a silver, silver platter mm. now needed to be worked for. And the woman knew of no such thing as real work. She demanded things from others, especially those she believed were beneath her. She didn't feel the need to audition for roles as an actress and thought they should be just offered to her. No. The older she got, the less charming her immature rudeness became. I have issues with this, but that's okay. <laughs> We will talk about that in the after show. after show. People began to pay less and less attention to her. She started getting less work as an actress, leading to her bills coming in more then they went out, and for once she didn't know what to do. So one day, the woman caught a glimpse of a man in the audience of one of her shows. Seeing live theater on Broadway was for either the locals or the wealthy, or the local wealthy. Outside the theater, on the closing night of the last production she ever performed in, she began talking to the man who could do nothing but dote upon how beautiful and talented she was. The man was from out of town, and the couple spent the next couple of days sightseeing, picnicking in Central Park, eating all the best restaurants, and having the time of their lives. Before the man was about to leave the city to return home, the woman confessed her love for his money, I mean him, <laughs> and he agreed to take her with him. The woman left everything and everyone she knew back in New York and moved in with the rich young man. Very soon after they were married, talks of children were already on the way. The new husband went out to the best jeweler he could find and bought her a pearl necklace. The woman loved her necklace almost as much as he, she loved her new house. However, just months after their wedding, the woman's husband was in a tragic, fatal accident. <gasps> the woman reported to the sheriff that her husband had been murdered just after their honeymoon. When the police arrived on the scene, they found the man's body alone in a pool of blood. The man's head had been severed. Whoa! And that's not a tragic accident. Just feet from the crimson soaked stump it was once attached to. Ew. The man, along with his head, were both buried in the family graveyard. <laughs> the woman showed very little concern for her husband and instead lived off the money she had inherited from him. The woman was never questioned, and the real murderer was never found. The police did conclude that the weapon was a small, sharp instrument that you would have to swing many times to cut completely through a man's neck the Ooh. way they found the victim. Ew. Soon afterward, the woman had everything about her late husband, even a small, freshly cleaned hatchet that she had taken out of his tool shed, hidden away within the dark corners of the attic of her new house. Interesting. The woman lived well with her husband's money and even took very good care of his home. After a while, the woman got bored in that big old house. She craved more excitement. 
she decided to go out and find another husband. <laughs> Soon Ooh. after, the next man came along and moved into the woman's home. He moved into the woman's home after selling his home for quite a profit. The man loved the woman and bought her an even more expensive pearl necklace than her last husband did. Wow. Soon after they were married, he too met with a terrible tragedy. Huh. The woman invited her new husband into the attic. She retrieved her old hatchet and struck the man in the neck. Oh, they're being just flat out with this one. Even after he fell, she continued to attack the man with the hatchet, flinging his blood all over the walls and ceiling. After his spine had been disconnected, Uh the man was indeed very dead. (laughs) Indeed. Indeed. Indubitably. Mm. (laughs) The woman continued to finish the job, severing the head completely. Mm. The woman collected all that her new late husband had left for her and buried him in the graveyard next to her previous dead husband. With his head. Within three years, there were two more graves that had been dug next to theirs. The woman had just received her fifth and most expensive pearl necklace. They should stop buying her those. What? She had more money and extravagant riches than she could ever hoped for. She always kept her wedding dress neat and clean and pressed. Her last husband already had a child, a grown boy, from his late wife. The boy had thought that the marriage between the woman and his father had happened too quickly to be genuine and suspected that the woman was just after his money. No way. The boy went over to her house the day after the man had moved in and looked around for him. After hearing a peculiar sound coming from the attic, he went up to investigate and saw the woman wearing her wedding dress, hacking away at the bloody mess that was once his father. What the fuck? The boy tackled the woman and took the hatchet out of her hand. He fought the woman, but it was far too late to save his father. He plunged the hatchet into her chest, claimed that a demon as heartless as her doesn't deserve one. So he hacked away at her chest, breaking through her rib cage and tearing through the woman's chest. He reached into and gained a slippery hole on her slowly beating heart and pulled it violently out of her body. This is like a like Indiana Jones shit. The boy stood and stared down at what he had done. He reached down and pulled the wedding ring. (laughs) The wedding ring his father had given her off of her finger and threw it out of the attic window. He shoved the woman's body into a nearby trunk. What? All that is known is that the woman's latest husband rests in the family graveyard next to the others. As for the woman, her body was never recovered and still lies in the trunk in the attic. The boy had hidden the woman's heart somewhere in that attic. Obviously not in the trunk with hers. Because to this day, the woman searches desperately for her heart. And also, as a side note here, the boy happened to meet his own death in that very same attic. Hmm. But let's continue on with the end of our story. So... As she searches desperately for her own heart, she feels only hatred and the need for the belongings of others. Her spirit has been seen through the attic window, still holding the hatchet she killed with. Should you see her spirit, she would come to you as beautiful as she's always been. She will give you the friendliest and most welcoming of smiles. She will show off all that she has collected throughout the years and make you feel very comfortable. This is when you need to turn around and leave immediately. If you should stay, it is said that you will hear the loud rhythmic thumping of her heart beating somewhere in the attic, just out of her grasp. She will lure people in with her beauty only for them to disappear. After she has vanished, she will then reappear to you in a mirror, contorted and grotesque as the tormented soul has now captured you. You will see her beauty fade into the true monster that she has become. Or maybe always was, really. You will see her wedding dress dripping with blood and feel her cold breath beating down the back of your neck. 
cherish the feel of your neck because that is her target. <laughs> Enjoy your neck. Enjoy your neck. The next thing you feel is a sharp yet blunt strike to your neck. No matter how hard you fight or where you try to run, your head will feel as though it is tearing itself from your body. Number of victims, 22. Name of this ghost, Constant Hathaway. I thought you were going to say Bloody Mary, which I know is Mary, Queen of Scots, but still. <laughs> stand in the mirror and go, Bloody Mary, Bloody oh, Mary. Did anybody ever do that? Bloody oh, Mary. All the time. Yeah. Still do. <laughs> you, you gotta look at yourself in the mirror, then turn a lot off, and then you see your reflection turn. Because oh, yes. you said when you look in the mirror mm. and it turns from yes, from you to her. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> All right. Bloody Mary. Last ghost story. Mm. Now the story of the last three spirits is importantly intertwined. They are also the three most deadliest ghosts. So listen closely. Okay. okay. During the early 1930s in northern Florida, there lived three brothers. They were a close-knit family, and the devastation of the Great Depression only brought them closer. The youngest brother, who was 24, was lanky, pale, and although he was always very spirited, the boy suffered from dangerous case of am uh, amnesia. No. Anemia. The middle brother, 27, was the most heavy set of the three. He was known by his family as being the most well read and carried an extensive knowledge of many subjects, specializing in several fields of human science. The oldest brother, who was 30, oddly enough the shortest, worked closely with their father at a Ford assembly line and had an extensive amount of long, unkept facial hair. <laughs> Why that's important, I do not know. It's it common like right now, though. That would be I mean, COVID hair assembly line. <laughs> right? Yeah, right. Be caught up in something. Soon after the stock market crashed, their father became ill and their finances had been cut severely since losing his job. The family could no longer afford the medical care that their father needed. They had just enough money left to help their father get the treatment he needed for his sickness or for one of the brothers to go to school. The three brothers wanted nothing more than to help their father, obviously, but the father wanted the brightest one of the three to go to school. The answer was made clear, and it was the father's final wish for the middle son to pursue his dream of becoming a surgeon. They all spent much time grieving over the loss of their father. Everyone in the family was supportive of the middle boy, who wished to work towards a cure to the illness that had claimed their father and helped people in general. Now what makes this story so peculiar is that no one is completely sure of the names of these three brothers. It is most commonly known that the middle son was referred to as the Traveler, for he commuted to an out-of-state school and loved to sightsee as a child. He dressed his best for school, donning his father's coat and bowler hat. School was new and excited. It wasn't excited for him. <laughs> it was exciting for him. He loved learning new subjects along with furthering his knowledge of anatomy and medicine. After two years of extensive medical training, the traveler took a break and headed back home. The youngest brother had a rare disease that increased his growth and metabolism almost more than his body could keep up with. He was incredibly tall and skinny. He could not gain a healthy amount of muscle tissue, and in most areas of his bodies, of his body, because he only had one, <laughs> his bones could be seen through his skin. Oh. His face, ribs, and arms were just some of those areas. His eyes grew big and sunken into his face. His lips grew wider and made his smile much more prominent and haunting. He was fully capable other than a general physical weakness and had occasional shortness of breath. Due to his childish naivety, it was nothing he ever worried about really. However, his brothers kept a keen eye on him. Though his name was also forgotten with time, the records refer to him as the skeleton because of his hideous form. 
Unfortunately, however, the traveler ran out of money when the school raised its tuition, so he had to move back home before finishing. The brothers had no money to live off. The family was almost out of ideas on how to survive. Soon afterwards, while reading up on the end of Prohibition and with the war beginning to rage, the eldest son struck upon an idea. The idea was simple, that he and his brothers would become moonshiners and bootleggers. (laughs) It was as good an idea as any, and they figured they had nothing more to lose. They couldn't believe that times had gotten this desperate, but they were willing to do anything it took to care for one another. However, a problem arose. They had to sell their family Model T, so they had nothing to run their product with. The eldest son mulled around the desperation of his family before coming up with a drastic solution to their problem, one that he was too ashamed to share with his family. He went out one night and took a long walk down a particularly lonely highway. About three hours into his walk, he prepared himself for what he was about to do. The brother held out his thumb and waited for a passing car. Soon after, headlights hit him and a Model T slowed down and pulled up next to the man. The driver was headed home with his wife and two children. The brother wasted no time. He pulled out his revolver and shot the man in the face. What? Um. The wife and the children frantically got out of the car as the brother pushed the bloody remains of their loved one onto the dirt road and he drove off with their car. The brother didn't answer any of his brother's questions about the new vehicle and soon they just gave up asking and accepting what was now theirs. Soon the oldest brother was bringing in several different cars at night, and eventually it got to the point where they could fix up one really great car and make their shine runs in it. Their moonshine run business was working out very well. Soon the eldest brother was bringing in several different cars a night, and eventually it got to the point where they could fix one up into a really great car and make their, sh- make their shine runs. Their shine run business was working out very well, but the eldest brother could not hold on to his secret for much longer and told his brothers about where the cars were coming from. The three brothers had long since crossed over into the survival of the fittest mindset of poverty and understood that the eldest had to do what he had to do to support them. The shine running was pulling in just enough money to keep food on the table, but they felt that they could do better. Soon afterward, the other two brothers felt that they too were ready to make the cross into the work the eldest brother found himself in. The plan was to pose as hitchhikers on the side of the roads that didn't see much traffic. They all had their plan on what they would do once they were out on the road. The skeleton had a blade ready for his plan, and the traveler, the least violent one, had a syringe filled with a strong anesthetic that he had learned to make while in school. They all spread out and covered different roads. The eldest son continued with his brute plan while the skeleton tried a different approach. He held his thumb high and waited for a chance to finally show his big brothers what he could do. Once someone pulled over to pick him up, he would sit behind the driver specifically. After having ridden for several minutes, the skeleton would pull a small blade out of his coat pocket and slice open the throat of the driver. Fighting to take control of the car, he would pull it over to the side of the road. The passenger would normally run screaming. He would catch up with the passenger, hold them down, and carve out their eyes with a knife. Ew. He would be quick about it so long as to never be seen by anyone else driving by. One by one, he would jam his knife into their sockets and skewer them and render them painfully useless. So as to make sure the person never tells anyone of him or his brother, he would rip out their tongue as well. Gross. As messy of a job as he chose to go about it, peeling out his victim's tongues with his jagged, dull blade would usually be the last thing they would feel before death. 
a sacrifice the skeleton was willing to make for his family. <laughs> he made his brothers proud by collecting many cars this way over the course of many, many years. While the eldest son continued with his terrorizing plans of forcing whole families out of their cars and making them grieve in the middle of nowhere, the traveler was a different sort of operator. He knew he was willing to do anything for the good of his family, but recreational violence was just not part of his makeup. He too would hitchhike all up and down lonely stretches of road searching for lone drivers in particular. He carried with him a briefcase that he used throughout med school, filled with various anesthetics, acids, and poisons. He knew that he would have better luck trying to subdue one person instead of many. Once someone pulled over to let him in, the traveler would smile back at them, show his appreciation, and tell them where to go. Along the drive, the traveler would reach into his briefcase and discreetly pull out a brightly colored syringe. He would plunge it straight into the driver's chest and take control of the vehicle. Before the driver had time to react, they would be completely sedated. The traveler would push them over into the passenger seat and take control of the car all the way back to the family's workshop. At first, the traveler would just gently push the bodies out of the car somewhere along the road, only hoping that they would awaken before any roadside critters like snakes, scorpions, or spiders would get to them first. Eventually, he began thinking to himself how he was robbed of his experience in med school. All that money wasted because the state college became too greedy towards their students. It angered him. He had been wronged when all he wanted to do was help people. The people in his passenger seat could be all the schooling he needed, that all he really needed was practice to become a doctor. He started taking the bodies back to the workshop where they stripped down the cars and held off a little room to the side all for himself. His first real victim was like exploring a fantasy land to him. He wanted to know everything there was about the amazing world of anatomy and surgical arts. He laid the bodies across a long metal table and stripped them down. He always remembered his first cut. It was the careful one, like slowly opening a Christmas present. He uncovered and removed everything he could find, including lungs, kidneys, livers, anything he touched and removed. He did. Sometimes the victims would wake screaming, but it wouldn't last long. It was so much fun to the traveler. The more often the traveler brought victims home, the more experience he had with his rusty surgical equipment, and really the less careful he became about his teachings. His childlike spirit was very much alive amongst such a macabre scene of blood and entrails. But so long as he cleaned everything up after he finished, his family didn't mind. The brothers had been carefully collecting cars from people for several months before the eldest was finally caught by the police. Several of the victims he left alive gave away his description to the police. Without giving the names of his brothers, his accomplices, he was given life in prison and the other two brothers found work very difficult without their brother. The skeleton and the traveler decided to go on one last run and break their brother out of prison and to live the rest of their lives way down in the deep south. The information I was given doesn't exactly say how they broke him out, but once they did, the eldest was nicknamed the prisoner and they headed south in a stolen car. They hid out from motel to motel, using fake names and taking every precaution to cover their tracks as they made their way down south towards a small, growing town where they could try and start a new life. After several days without food on their run, the stress of their inevitable capture and imprisonment was almost too much for them to handle. They knew the police were actively looking for the prisoner and his accomplices, but were they willing to go to the end of the world to avoid being caught and separated from each other? 
Fueled by pure adrenaline, they rocketed down an empty highway with the police bearing down on their path, and wherever they ended up is where they had to hide. After exhausting every resource they had on their final run, the trio abandoned their car on the side of the road and ran until they came across a cemetery. Knowing that the police would be on site in a matter of seconds behind them, the brothers wasted no time in weighing what little options they had and jumped a large gated fence around a nice-sized cemetery in the backyard of a giant mansion. They then broke and hid inside its only mausoleum. No one knew for sure what happened to the brothers after that. However, there are rumors they lived in that stone cage as long as they could before dying of hunger. Others say that they died of fright by what they saw within the mausoleum. The bodies of the brothers were never found and they had never been seen alive since. I repeat myself for the utmost importance. These three ghosts, the traveler, prisoner, and skeleton, are the three most deadliest ghosts. There is but one road in America that drives by the cemetery in which they spent their last moments. Whether it's day or night, should you just drive by that cemetery, you are inviting them, enticing them. They cannot resist the temptation to rid you of what they cannot have. These ghosts are not limited to one particular place, like a house. These spirits are much more unpredictable and versatile. If you drive this one road, you will see someone hitchhiking on the side. Whatever you do, do not pick them up. It may be mean to any person who is just honestly looking for a ride. And this is like really good advice anyway. Don't pick people up, y'all. But it is not worth the risk. At this point, the only hope you have is to pass them and look in your rear view mirror. If you see them in the reflection outside your car, you are safe. If not, it means that they have chosen you as their ride. If this is the case, immediately get out of the car, pull over as soon as you can, and leave it there forever. If you do not, you will become their next victim. Depending on how many people are in the car will depend on which brother you will have riding with you. Should you be driving with one other person in the car, you will be at the mercy of the skeleton. If you are driving, you will see whoever is sitting in the passenger seat suddenly look over at you. Even if you do not look back at them, you know what you will see is blood smear sockets and an empty jaw fallen lifelessly. By the time you recognize it, you will feel the cold release race across your neck. By the time your car crashes, you and your passenger will already be dead. Should you be driving with the family and do not heed the warning of the hitchhikers, your death will be simply at the hands of the prisoner. Quick, quiet, nothingness will fill your thoughts as your head explodes with a tennis ball size hole and it suddenly slams into the steering wheel and the car rockets into whatever lies in its path, killing all within. Should you drive alone, you might as well have been walking from the start. The traveler used to be someone with compassion and mercy while he was alive, but once he's a rider in your car, you will find him much different. At first, you will become nauseous to the point of wanting to pull over and throw up, but you don't because you can't. It will only get worse from there. Your nose will begin to bleed and you will have a gurgling feeling in your stomach. You will begin to cough up blood and your vision will become blurry. You will try to pull over, but the traveler won't let you. He enjoys traveling with you while practicing his craft. Don't worry though, death isn't far behind this point. You won't suffer for too long. Number of estimated collective victims, 41. Name of the ghost, the traveler, the skeleton, the prisoner, a.k.a. the hitchhikers. This is the end of my research into the most dangerous killer ghost. I hope this list will help you somewhere down the line. God forbid you ever come across one of these spirits. 
I really try not to let what has happened to me in my own home scare me, but I'd rather be scared than dead. These stories are certainly not a dare invitation to test the rumors of these ghosts, whether you believe in them or not. They are dangerous and do not care for your personal beliefs. I did dig a little deeper into these cases, as dismaying as it is. I need you to consider this observation. All of these cases are based out of southern Louisiana and around a single house, the very same house for all of them. The attic, the cemetery, the portrait room, it is all connected. There is something about that house or the land that provokes the evil around it. Though I will not say what the place is called to spare you the trip, I am not giving out any more specific details than that which have already been established. No one, especially any of you that have listened through the last two episodes and clearly know of the dangers they present, should be going anywhere near this house. The house has been hidden from the public since the accidents began and just need to be forgotten. Just remember to be careful. There are many things in this world that we do not understand and the cost of venturing into the unknown could be your life. I pray for your safety and hope that you may never fall victims to the spirits of the world's most haunted mansion. So if you have figured out the exact location of this haunted mansion, give us a shout out on Instagram, Facebook, through our email, Stories at the Strange South, and the first person to answer correctly will get a Strange South goodie bag. Oh, cool. And that's the end of my saga. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's a real place. It is a real place. And I will tell you ladies. Oh, okay, good. Off the record. Now for the break. Do you want more Strange South every week? We can help. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and you can join our Facebook fan group, Fans of a Strange South Podcast, to keep the chat going with our whole creepy community. Do you have a story idea for us or a story of your own to share? Email us at stories at the strange south.com. Plus, if you join our Patreon, you not only help support the podcast, you get an exclusive bonus episode for every show and a discount on merch. You can find links to all of these things on our website, thestrangesouth.com, along with photos, links, and show notes from every episode, Strange South t-shirts, mugs, and other goodies. See you there. This is a little bit more old school than what I've been doing lately. This is I was I've been trying to go back a little Ooh. bit to closer to like this the kind of stuff that I did when we started. Ooh. So, but awesome. it's you know we're running out of shit. You know we it's are. like the simple stories we're kind of running out of shit. So, yes, this one. What I'm going to tell you to start this one is actually kind of a kid's story, mm. and it was written by an author named Cal Cachot, and I'll send the link in the show notes. A man builds a one-room shack on the bayou southwest of New Orleans. This long, long time ago. Uh, you know, this is Once upon a time kind of thing. Near the, the haunted mansion. Maybe. Could be. But this is not a haunted mansion. Okay. This is a one-room shack. You know, he's a single dude. He's a young man. He catches catfish to live on. He catches... He traps gators for, you know, pel- you know he can sell gator skins for money and um, for their hides and so this was one thing i'd never heard before he collects spanish moss to sell because apparently in like the the like mid to late 1800s like furniture makers would fill upholstery with spanish moss as like a filler Mm -hmm. so you could sell spanish moss if you collected it and so that was one of the things that he did so one day he went into the city to sell his moss to the furniture makers and he sees this beautiful girl in the city because this is a once upon a time story so you know this has got to come right right so she's probably 13, which I'm like, red flag, red flag, red flag. Right. But um, when the when the man goes up to talk to her, this this dude that's with her, who's clearly her dad, right, is dressed fancy. And I picture him with like a an eye monocle and a cane and a top hat or and, something. And a hat box. And a hat box. So but, I'm telling um, you, same area. It might be the same guy. <laughs> so... um. So, you know, when this when this young man walks up to her, her dad basically like hits him with this cane and tells him to get like 
this get, is you know get gone. get gone get away from my daughter you're not good enough Psh, get away right so the man though he this young man he's not going to be put off and he hangs about in the city instead of going home he finds out where she lives this is this is the classic creepy story of the guy who stalks the girl to get her to marry him Ugh. so he figures out ways to get messages to her they set up secret meetings, and then one day they meet in a graveyard, and they're like, is it that graveyard? It may be that graveyard. And Crossover they, stories. I know. And they sneak away to the chapel to be married. So um, she moves to the one-room shack, and of course her dad is like, fuck no, this, you know. But she moves to the one-room shack, and they have a son. His name, they name him Timothy, and they name him Timothy after the girl's father. Because, you know, they don't want him to, they don't want to be disowned or, you know, I mean, they want to have a relationship. So, um, they want the inheritance. When they, when they bring the baby to introduce him to his grandfather, he actually forgives everything and he's like, oh, I love this baby. And so, you know, happy family. Then they have another baby and they name this baby Petit Jean after the man's father who had died long ago. I guess his father's name was Jean. So they, they name him Petit Jean and, um, they shorten it to T Jean. So then they have a third baby, a little girl named Sue. A girl named Sue. Girl named Sue. And the boys, during the days, they would go in the pirogue with the dad, and they would help fish, and they would help trap gators. And Sue would stay at home and help, you know, it's all traditional gender rules, stay at home, help mom cook, all that kind of stuff. So time passes. Timothy turns 12, and he says, I'm 12 years old. I'm a man. I'm taking the pirogue, and I'm going hunting by myself. Okay, hold on. Stop. What are you saying? Piro, piro, the boat, the boat. Okay, the little flat bottom. New, little. yeah, like a cage, is it a Cajun word mm -hmm. for like a kind of a, a like a. It's a fishing boat. It's like a, a okay. flat bottom fishing okay. boat. And um, so he says, "I'm gonna go hunting by myself," and he goes, and then you know they wait for him to come back, and they wait, and they wait, and he doesn't. Mm. So days later, they find the pirogue drifting loose in LaRue Swamp, where both of the boys are told they are never allowed to go. So LaRue Swamp was deep, deep water swamp. Mm. And the native people would never go there. And they were um, the Atakapa, I think is how you say it, is the native tribe from the area. And they were indigenous to coastal Louisiana. And um, they said that the swamp was home to a monster. Oh, wow. So they said that their story was, according to this story, according to this author, that a girl of their tribe had been abused by the men of the tribe for a long time. And she finally runs away and swears vengeance to all mankind. This happens a long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. So in the swamps, there lived an alligator spirit. And the spirit took pity on her when she ran into the swamp to run away from her tribe. So he told her that if she would love him and stay with him, that he would provide for her and give her protection. Beauty so he did. Beast. It's totally Beauty and the Beast, <laughs> except with a ghost Gator. alligator. <laughs> and and so, you know, they live a life together in the swamp. And when she dies many, 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 many years later, she leaves behind her son, who is immortal because he's the son of a spirit alligator. Right. Right. I guess that's how, how it did works. This work? And he, I, you mean like Conception. the logistics? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't really. I don't, we'll talk about that in the after talk. After talk. We'll save that Got for it. the after talk. <laughs> so, but she leaves behind her son to protect and haunt LaRue Swamp. So the son of the, the girl and the spirit alligator is said to have a body like a man, but to be covered in scales and to walk upright with the gait of a man, but the head of an alligator. And he has long, terrible claws and his hair is like, is like Spanish moss. So not long after Timothy's disappearance, the yellow fever comes. Mm -hmm. So Tijon is 10 now and Sue is with her grandpa in the city and she catches the sickness in the city and grandpa catches it too. And both of them die. Mm. So this, like all this, all these people are getting lost. You know, the water in the bayou is drying up. They have to start digging for eels in the mud flats because they can't fish anymore in the bayou because all the water is gone. But then the mud flats also dry up. And the only place with water deep enough to fish is LaRue Swamp. So 
Tijon's father knows that this is the only place he can get food anymore. And one day he tells Tijon that you have to protect your mother. I have to go out to Laro Swamp and face this myth and hope I can come back with some catfish to feed you and your mom. God, I'm wanting catfish now. <laughs> God, I love me some catfish. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Sorry. So weeks go by and he doesn't come back. Tijon's mother then starts to shiver and turn her skin starts to turn kind of a pale yellow color. She's caught the fever now. Mm. And he knows Tijon's the only person left in the house. And he knows that if she could have a good meal, that's the only thing that he can do personally. That's the only thing he can do to help. He can feed her. That's all he can do. But he has to do something. So he grabs his fishing pole and he goes out to La Rose Swamp. And his mom is crying, stay, stay, stay. But he's just like, this is this is the only choice I have left. So Tijon knows that the only thing that can hurt the monster of the swamp is to be pierced with the staff of sweet gum wood. So he takes a sapling of sweet gum before he goes and he whittles it down to a point and he takes it with him. So near dusk, he comes to the edge of LaRue Swamp and he grips his sweet gum staff hard and he finds a place to set his pole and he baits his hook with rotten cheese and flour and he fishes. But he fishes for a long time and there's not there's not a ton of luck here. But he's still thinking this is the best chance I've got. You know, this is I'm here. And then it starts to get dark and then it starts to rain. So he's on kind of high ground and he stretches a cord between two trees and he hangs an oil cloth over it for shelter and goes to sleep under the oil cloth and leaves his poles out. So in the middle of the night, he wakes up with a start and it stopped raining. And there's a carpet of fog in the swamp. And he starts to hear this sound of something dragging through wet leaves really close. Mm -hmm. So he reaches his hand out and lifts the oil cloth just a little bit and sees this long reptilian tail dragging along the ground outside his shelter. But instead of joining with the crawling body of an alligator, which is scary enough if you're sleeping on the ground under right. an oil cloth in a Real swamp alligators. in Louisiana. right. It arcs up and joins the body of a man standing upright, covered oh, in shit. bumpy brown scales. And it turns its head towards him, and it's the head of an alligator. And Tijon gets his wits back and just bolts out into the woods, but he can hear it behind him, and it's coming. It's coming faster and faster. It's gaining on him. So suddenly he feels himself just knocked sprawling on the ground by a cuff on the side of his head. And then he feels another strike, and he can watch the muddy leaves kind of part in front of his face as he's dragged feet first towards the water of LaRue Swamp. And he starts to scream, but his screams turn to gurgles as the Parlangua, which is the immortal son of this Indian girl and the alligator spirit god, drag him into the murky depths of the swamp. Oh, wow. And that's the story that's told by Cal Cashew. And the name of the story that he tells is The Legend of the Parlangua, a Louisiana swamp tale. Wow. So the version that version of the story is actually in a song. It was written by a band called The Cahoots, and it was released in the in the 1980s. So I'll find it. I got a oh, YouTube of cool. that and I can put it on the show page. But like so that story is like immortalized in this kind of kind of country song. So it's it's kind of a cool piece of lore that mm -hmm. I liked a lot. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering, like, is where'd this come from? Like, is this just lore? So right. I started looking up Parlangua. Parlangua. And so there's this. It says that in the 1960s, there's a car accident. And this is supposedly real life in Rapides Parish that a man seemingly loses control of his car and he leaves the road and crashes in the swamp. And two witnesses ran to the side of the road where the car had crashed. And when they catch sight of the car in the swamp, they see the driver climbing out and they're like, Oh, okay, good. You know, he's not injured. Mm -hmm. And then they see something stand up out of the swamp. And the quote that was provided for this was it had the head of an alligator with glowing yellow eyes but the arms and legs looked human and it stood upright like a man and it attacks the driver of the car and bites off his legs and his head. Ah! 
and then runs off into the swamp. What? Now, is there a police report on this? <laughs> I couldn't find it. That's the thing, because this story was told in Beasts of the Bayou on Discovery Channel. Oh, there's a 2014, wow. there was a 2014 episode that was, um, I think it's called Half Man, Half Alligator, and it covers the Parlangua. And they Parlangua. tell this story and say that this creature might have been the Parlangua. But like when they talk about this newspaper report, they say there was a 1960s newspaper report. They don't say the name of the newspaper, mm-hmm. you know, and we've right. got we've subscriptions. Got I looked. Yeah. I tried a whole bunch of different search Pick-a-hum. terms. I could not find Tell anything about mm. this story, about this car crash, decapitation, repeats. I couldn't find it. But, um, you know, what they describe was a half man, <laughs> half gator. And it's it's something that crawls while stalking prey, but attacks on two legs and has like abnormally long claws and the head of a gator, the body of a man covered in scales. So according to the show, though, like people have gotten had more sightings of these things in Louisiana swamps in recent years and that they started up in Rapides Parish, but then they kind of moved south and increased in frequency, the oh, sightings wow. of these things. Um so now what you're seeing is a lot of people re- reporting these weird sightings of these weird alligator creatures in the southern end of Louisiana in the marshlands there in the swamps, which I'm like, I mean, we've talked about this before when we're talking about all kinds of cryptids. There's some scary shit out there. Like yes. you don't need half man, half gator to be scared of shit in no, the swamps. No, no. You can see like, exactly. like gators standing i mean if you think about it you see all these videos of like cats standing and walking on two legs which is terrifying which is terrifying my cat does that and so (laughs) you know of them just standing like around smoking a cigarette she does that too you know cc smoking Mm -hmm. (laughs) so why not gators standing on two legs kind of like walking around and the, the weird thing is, like, if I thought of a gator actually standing on two legs, like, kind of the unwieldiness. I mean, it would be funny first, right. you know, because I can't imagine that with a tail as muscular and long as a gator tail, that there is a gator that could stand up on two legs and not just wobble and fall. You well, know what unless I mean? they use that tail in a way that kind of boosts them where they can like, like Tigger, like, like dunk, 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 yes, dunk, exactly dunk, like Tigger, about no. tigger. Tigger's but like, a wonderful out, thing. It but like, like leans back, back. Yeah, yeah, and to prop them up and yeah. stuff. Oh, I mean, so like a kangaroo does, right. Oh, yeah, they do have that big, strong tail like a kangaroo does. So, yeah, I could see that. So, you mean, one of the things one of the things that have, like, really fucked me up when I was young, because, you know, you always look on ground for snakes in the mm-hmm. south. So, that you know, that's one of the things. You're in the woods. Your eyes are on the ground, making sure that you're not fizzing to step on something. Mm-hmm. But what really fucked me up is my mom is like, well, you know, snakes can, like... They stand. Stand. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. Yep. No, no. Mm, Until I saw a snake stand up like three feet <gasps> and I'm like, fuck. No. Yeah. And then this week my brother sends me, he likes he always likes to send me like videos of shit that he knows is gonna like just creep me out. So he sends me a video of flying snakes. What the fuck? So there are actual, in India, there's actually, like, a species of snakes that kind of like the flying squirrel things. No. They flatten out, and they can travel, like, 100 (laughs) meters. Oh, my God. And just, like, I'm just, like, I do not need flying snakes in my life. The next thing, I mean, we could make a movie. We should make a movie, Snake Tsunami. I think we should make a movie about that. We're just, like, the wind... Dirt devil picks up a bunch of flying snakes. Just oh, throws no. Throws them at people. Throws them at people. Yes. Yes. No, I've seen those standing snakes. I've seen them in my own damn backyard. They they stand up what? out of the clovers. Yes. And they look at you. Mm-hmm. Yes. And you're like, not today, Satan. And my dog was like, um. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm going back inside. The little one's going to get fucking destroyed if I don't. She doesn't know she lives in a wild land. <laughs> So anyway, so yes, back to uh, sorry, standing no, gators. No, totally. This is like yes. this is legit. Um, so they this this so this TV Discovery Channel show. You know, I never watch these. Like, and and then I always do like cryptid stories, and then I find out like Discovery Channel did some Has story done on it. them for mm-hmm. ages ago. But 
I always think they're kind of dumb because yeah. so many of they're them are, are so like contrived. You know, yes. all these stories. We're just talking about a story. Yes. But they they talked about a, a fisherman. They interviewed this fisherman named Joseph Krupse, and he did have a police report. Oh, wow. He, in 2014, he was out fishing with his dog. He had a pit bull dog um, named Bessie, and he went out fishing. And the police report says that he leaned over the side of his boat to splash water on his face. And I was like, the fuck you doing? I was like... I'm, I, I was like, do you do you do that Mm-mm. for real? When Actually, s- okay. I've, as somebody that used to go fishing a lot, when it's real hot, when it's real hot, I have been known to like stick my feet over the boat yeah, into the bait. water, and I have known, you know, to like, yeah, be in the water to cool off. But were you in the swamps of Louisiana? I was, or in the swamps the of Mississippi. Swamps of Mississippi. Yes. So you could have gotten eaten by an alligator. No, <laughs> but I'm saying, like, if I live somewhere like that, it, it's and not you're comfortable with it, and I'm comfortable with it. It's yeah. not unheard of. Okay. Yes, and that's what I was looking for because I was just thinking, was like, just my like, first response was like, "Who the fuck gonna lean over? Have you not it's seen 2014?" Crocodile and I'm sure they have a cooler full of beer, so I think they're more well, likely to that pull too. the ice out and put it on their face. But, but still, <laughs> I'm and I'm kind of I was. 50 50 so i was kind of like thinking that idea patrice that you're mm-hmm. saying too so it was like eh. but um so this guy apparently he leans over to uh, out of his boat to splash water in his face and he says that an alligator creature jumped up out of this you know and they're in deep water swamp jumps mm-hmm. up out of the swamp grabs his dog and basically tussles with her tries to pull her under multiple times and then really does succeed to pull her into the water out of the boat oh wow and he um so she finally the the dog's finally given up fighting it you know by the time it gets pulled out because it's a pit bull like you don't just do things to a pit bull like they fight you back right but he said it was like an alligator but with long arms and a human-sized head and he took a picture of it. <gasps> and I wish I had actually, I, I can pull it up real quick, maybe for you two, but I'll describe it for everybody else. And I will have it on have our show page. The picture now? Yeah. So. Um, I was going to Google it. <laughs> no, it's, you can't Google it. That's the other weird thing about this. You can't Google that dude's name. You can't get this picture on Google. I had to screenshot it from this one video. Oh, it's a so, conspiracy. And I'm like, so I don't know about that. Okay. But um, hold on. Let me X out of this episode of Demon Slayer real quick. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and pull up this. So what what you'll be looking at when you see it is a screenshot of what they provided in this documentary and it's here grab my grab my okay, laptop hold if you can so to me if i had to describe it i would say it's kind of creature of the black lagoon thing that we're looking at here oh my God. you can it's very fuzzy yeah. and you can kind of see the dog in the picture and you can kind of see the critter so what kind of dog is this a little dog it's a pit bull oh and in the in the picture, it's swimming away from the thing, and the thing is reaching one hand, and the hand is definitely humanoid. The hand looks like a human. Out of the water, the face. Looks and that's like what I'm a... like. I'm thinking, does the dude have a camera? Is he taking it with it? It's 2014 though, so he's taking it with his phone. I'm sure. Yet the water looks a little. I'm I'm like you know Photoshop possibility is strong on this one. Mm-hmm. And it does. It's. It's it very creature like, of the black lagoon. Yeah, to like me. a lizard head. It's a it's a yeah rounded it's like, head kind of Yes, it's much helmet-y. more human head. It's got kind of it's not um, a gator head. Webby sort of ear thing yeah. going on, like yeah. a gilly ear yeah. thing happening. You know, but you know, he provided this photo. You know, it's not a bad photo. It's it's not the worst. I mean it's it's creepy. It I mean is. it does look like a critter, but it's definitely not a gator. No. Like you look at this photo and you're not looking at an alligator no. that took this I think, this guy's dog. I think you totally nailed it. It's Creature of the Black Lagoon. It's Creature of the Black yeah. Lagoon. And it's facing away from the camera. So anyway, look at It's on, like the side view of it yeah. reaching. And look at so like profile. I said, I couldn't find I couldn't find a screen grab of this anywhere. I couldn't find his photo. I couldn't find his name. So if you want to see it, you know, either watch the episode, which you'll have a link for, or look on our show page, because I'm I screen grabbed it. So, you know, he takes this this picture of this thing that took his dog. And, um, you know, it's like, eh, 
it's, it's, not, it's bad. not a gator. It's not a gator. And it, it, I mean, it totally could be like deep fake photoshopped or whatever, yeah, yeah. but it's kind of decent. Yeah. It's not, it's not that bad. Mm-hmm. So I was like, so there's, you know, there's some good, like not just folklore, but there's some good, like there's some good lore, mm-hmm. like recent lore, like urban legend kind of lore on this one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, what about the debunking then? I was like the, later on in, uh, in the beasts show, they talked to this herpetologist and he says the kind of things that we've always said about, Bigfoots and stuff like that, which is like the cries of the bellows of a gator are terrifying. Right. It's if if people are reporting this creature and saying that it's got this ungodly roar, alligator. that's actually the sound of a mating call for mm. a male alligator. Right. And um, you know, usually when we were talking about like woods people and we're talking about, you know, them hearing noises and thinking this is this is not a fox, it's an actual and I'm more I'm less willing to believe like if you live in the woods, you do know the difference between a fox call right. and some weird ass critter that's screaming in the night. Like you can right. tell the difference. But you know, not everybody like lives flat up out in in the swamps, you know, and I'm like, I, I think gators are scary enough that maybe it's just not the noise of a gator, you know. Mm-hmm. But he also said that um, there's a rising gator population at this time. This was 2014. I don't know if this has changed um, in South Louisiana. And he said there was another possibility and they didn't give a whole lot of cred to this, but I looked into it cause he said that there could be a possibility of an incursion of Cuban crocodiles. So I was like, what the fuck is a Cuban crocodile? And they're a highly aggressive species of crocodile from Cuba. Oh, great. That have longer and stronger legs than an alligator. And they are unusually intelligent so oh, well, if great. they keep them in zoos, if they keep them captive, they've shown evidence of pack hunting behavior. Shit. So they work together to solve problems. They're oh, like fucking velociraptors from God. Jurassic Park, y'all. Yeah. Like they hunt together and they can be taught to do tricks. Like they're fucking smart critters. And um, they also stand on land more than gators. They're like more terrestrial. So they don't. So because of how, how their legs are, they don't slink like gators do. You know, like gators have very, very short, stubby legs. And when they go on land, it's like they're just running on their bellies, right? You know, when you see them, these things actually stand full up off the ground because their legs are strong and long. And I think I may have shared when I did my gator story, like a an, a video that somebody had talked uh, about a, a really long gator walking across a, a golf course. That fucking thing looked like one of these Cuban gators because it's got really long legs and it sits Look about a foot and a half it's off the ground. Up. There's one. That's... Wait, it's on its tail. Yeah, they stand. They fucking stand up on their tails. On their tails, it... they stand. They can stand yes. oh, upright like that. Mm-hmm. And so their legs are long, so they walk like dogs, and they also fucking jump. They <gasps> use their tails. Look at that! He's jumping. I know. That's a picture I'm gonna put on the. I'm gonna put that on the the site. So they use their tails to actually leap out of the water, and they can jump and grab things out of trees Fuck. and pull them down into the swamp. I am There's no hope. I for know. Us. They Stay jump out of the, out of the fucking water. There was a story that I read in like a what was it a herpetologist? Uh, I can't remember what the name. Uh, herpetologist review you which is a, it's a fucking journal it's so exciting i was like oh my god i'm such a fucking science geek yeah they stand up on their back legs on their tails so there's a study i read in herpetologist review about this it was many years ago and they said that this guy had visited someone in cincinnati ohio who kept a two meter specimen of a cuban crocodile in a large stock tank i was trying to think of how much two meters is it's a smaller one but two um meters are, it says they're about Two meters is the average. Oh, so maybe it's not a smaller one. So he kept this in a stock tank and he would cover with a, a heavy, heavy metal top. And the crocodile's resting when the guy walked in to show it off. And the guy lifted That's the six lid. Six feet. So there's it's three a feet in a meter. S- six yeah. foot, six foot crocodile. Yeah, there's three So the guy feet in lifts the lid to show off his, his crocodile that he's kept in the stock tank. And it's just been, it's just laying there. The whole reason he goes in to show it to people is because it's just laying there like a docile crocodile. He lifts the lid and the second he does, it explodes out of the tank with its mouth open 
and only the tail tip still in the water. It fucking launches itself and directs itself straight toward this dude's face. Oh my God. And it nearly gets him. But then he like he manages to just bounce right back and slams the like slams the lid back down on it. And you can hear its jaws snap together like an echo. And I'm like, oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> and it has no running start. It has like it's got it just out of from zero to fucking in the air in your face about to bite your head off. So, I mean, he's like, well, maybe this is the thing that people are seeing. Like, maybe there is something that jumps out of the water and grabs your dog out of a boat. Right. You know, it's not the thing in that picture. Right. But maybe there is something. But the, I started looking into it a little bit more and it doesn't look like this type of croc is like filling up Louisiana bayous because it's a it's a critically endangered species in mm -hmm. Cuba. Mm -hmm. And so but the thing is, they have shown that it hybridized with American crocodiles which we talked about like very briefly because we didn't realize that there were crocodiles in America. And right. it's not, it's, I don't think it's as much in Louisiana. It's like in the Eastern in the, in the like cooler waters, I think. But, um, but they have hybridized. So it is a possibility huh. that there are jumping like crazy ass crocodiles out there, oh, no. like taking people out. So if you're in Louisiana Yes. And you've seen something weird like that shit. Yes. Or if you'd heard stories of this parlangua, because I really am curious if this is something that just like arose out of the 1960s. Did it arise out of the Discovery Channel? Did it arise out of this dude's one story? Or is there actually like a deeper like local lore around this thing? I would love to know more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So if you have ever heard of the parlangua before... And it wasn't on Discovery Channel. Or if you've read something in the newspaper about it, let us know. Because I'm uh, like fascinated. Right. Your grand peppy saw one. Yeah, for yeah. real. Let us know. But yeah, that's it. That's all I got. I, it's just, it's short and sweet, but I was like, eee, it's creepy. No, that was perfect. Thank so, y'all so much for listening. Yes. Thank you guys. We appreciate you so much. Yes. And we will talk to you later. Bye. 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 <laughs> it's hunting in groups. Make it la, through. La, la, la. It's a really long fucking song, <laughs> y'all. <sighs> On the first day of Christmas, my rose cat brought to me <laughs> Yay! a dead rabbit under the bed. <laughs> <laughs> On the second day of Christmas, my rose cat brought to me two gutted squirrels Ew. and a dead rabbit <laughs> under the bed. This is amazing. On the third day of cr Christmas, my rose cat brought to me three departed wrens, two oh. gutted squirrels <laughs> and a dead rabbit under the bed. <laughs> On the fourth day of Christmas, my rose cat brought to me four baby robins, three departed friends, <laughs> two gutted squirrels, and a dead rabbit under the bed. And this is all true, y'all. On the fifth day of Christmas, my rose cat brought to me Five fucking huge <laughs> spiders. <laughs> Four baby robins. Three departed wrens. Two gutted <laughs> squirrels. And a dead rabbit under the bed. <laughs> On the sixth day of Christmas, my rose cat brought to me six. Ooh. <laughs> Six cicadas buzzing. Yay. Five fucking huge spiders. <laughs> Four baby robins. <laughs> three. Ooh. Yeah. Three.
a potted wrens, two gutted squirrels, <laughs> <laughs> and a dead rabbit under the bed. On the seventh day of Christmas, my rose cat brought to me seven mushed moles, Ew. six cicadas buzzing, <laughs> five fucking huge spiders, <laughs> four baby robins, three departed wrens, two gutted squirrels, and a dead rabbit under the bed. On the eighth day of Christmas, my rose cat brought to me eight headless lizards, seven mushy moles, six cicadas buzzing, five fucking huge spiders, <laughs> four baby robins, three departed wrens, two gutted squirrels, and a dead rabbit under the Bed. On the ni ooh, ninth day of Christmas, my rose cat brought to me nine feathered crime scenes, <laughs> eight headless lizards, seven mushy molds, six cicadas buzzing, five fucking huge spiders. <laughs> Four <laughs> <laughs> opens, three departed wrens, two gutted squirrels, and a dead rabbit under the bed. <laughs> On the tenth day of Christmas, my rose cat brought to me ten. Chewed up mice, nine Ew. feather crime seeds, eight <laughs> headless lizards, seven mushy moles, six cicadas buzz, five fucking huge spiders, <laughs> four baby robins, two, three departed wrens, two glutted squirrels, and a dead rabbit under the bed. On the eleventh <laughs> day of Christmas, my rose cat brought to me eleven leaping chipmunks, ten <laughs> chewed up mice, nine feathered crime scenes, eight headless lizards, seven mushy moles, six <laughs> cicadas buzzing, five fucking huge spiders. Four baby robins, three departed wrens, two gutted squirrels, and a dead rabbit under the bed. I'm going to try to sing along with this next one. All right. On the twelfth day of Christmas, my rose cat brought to me. Twelve heart attacks, <laughs> eleven leaping chipmunks, ten chewed up mice, nine feathered crime scenes, eight headless lizards, seven mushy moles, six cicadas buzzing, five fucking huge spiders. <laughs> Four baby robins, three departed wrens, two gutted squirrels, and a dead rabbit under the bed. <laughs> Thank you. Add that to your playlist. Yes. <laughs> That uke playing out. Woo! So I literally <laughs> sat there and listed everything that she has brought in. And it's like, I've got to make this work. That's the best. That's so cool. I never would have thought that would be your Christmas song. That was so good. That was so good. Rose. Cheers. 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 To Rose. To Rose. And oh. the rabbit under the bed. Oh. The departed rinse. <laughs> so good.